Good afternoon and welcome to today's McGill Alumni webcast, the first in a two-part series shining a spotlight on the upcoming U.S. election, a vote that has been deemed by many to be one of the most contentious and volatile political battles in U.S. history. My name is Derek Kassoff, Managing Director of Communications at McGill's Office of University Advancement, and it's Thursday, October 22nd. We are less than two weeks away from the day when Americans go to the polls to either re-elect President Donald Trump to a second four-year term, or turn to former Vice President and Democratic Party nominee Joe Biden as their next leader. From the coronavirus pandemic, to the Black Lives Matter protest movement, to sharply opposing views on climate change, tax reform, and the leanings of the Supreme Court, voters in the U.S. are facing a choice between two deeply different visions for the future of their nation, at a time when polarization in society has never been more stark. There's so much to unpack here, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by two of McGill's leading thinkers on the subject. So let me introduce them. First, we have Jason Opel, who's an associate professor at McGill and chair of the Department of History and Classical Studies. He's a contributor to many leading publications, including the Washington Post and the Los Angeles Times, and is the author of Avenging the People, Andrew Jackson, The Rule of Law and the American Nation. Welcome, Professor Opel. Welcome back uh, to, to this series. Thank you. And we also have uh, Mugambi Jouet, who is an assistant professor at McGill's Faculty of Law. Before embarking on a career in academia, he served as a public defender in Manhattan and as a criminal lawyer at The Hague. He is the author of Exceptional America, What Divides Americans from the World and from Each Other, which explores the relationship between American exceptionalism and the intense polarization of modern America. Welcome, Professor Jouet. Uh, and thank you both of you for taking the time to join us today for what I think will be a fascinating discussion, uh, just 12 days away from what is shaping up to be an historic election. A quick note for our viewers, both of our professors have agreed to come back in exactly two weeks time when we'll have a chance to review the results of the election and explain what it all means for the future of America, its allies and the health of democracy. And again, if you are uh, watching live and have questions for either of our panelists, you can send them into us via email at aoc at mcgill.ca and we'll do our best to address them to our guests. So I, re I referenced in the introduction how this election is considered by many to be perhaps the most historic one in US history. Though I do recall us saying that uh, the same thing back in 2008 when Barack Obama was running for the highest office. And I'm sure others have felt the same back in the days of Reagan, Kennedy and so on. So why don't we start there? Professor Opal, is this one a truly historic election? And what is at stake on November 3rd beyond Americans choosing their next leader? Well, I'd say that um, it's definitely a truism that uh, every election feels like and is, and is sort of sold as or, or described as an historic one by the people running for office. Um, there's a recent journalist who makes a good claim for was actually the 2000 election that was probably the most influential, um, you know, in the past generation or so. But I do think that this election is um, uh, exceptional, I guess I'll use that word, in the sense that uh, the, the sitting president, Donald Trump, has made it very, very clear um, that he will either not accept the results of the election or will contest them in some way beyond the, the normal uh, electoral process. That is exceptionally rare. Um, there have been a few times in American history in which before the election happened, there was the same sense of, um, of that the legitimacy of it will already be questioned, that there's even a kind of dread or fear of of violence or some other way to solve the, the political debate, but those are extremely few in American history. And so in that context, and for that reason, I would say it is exceptional and will be historic. Great, and we will have a chance, I hope, to get to some of these issues that you brought up, including the sanctity of the electoral process and what some of these threats from uh, President Trump might mean. But before we do that, let me turn over uh, quickly to Professor Jouet to get your thoughts on this. I mean, you've studied um, America and the American political system, both from within uh, the United States as well as from afar. Um, so how do you sort of contextualize this election in terms of the historic nature uh, of what we're seeing? The level of partisan polarization in America today is essentially at its highest point since uh, the US uh, Civil War in the 19th century. And we've seen uh, intensifying polarization already during the presidency of George W. Bush. America was reaching record levels of polarization over the economy, over questions like the invasion of Iraq, and uh, torture in Guantanamo. And we saw intensifying polarization when Barack Obama was uh, elected. 
uh, in the 2010 midterm elections, uh, Obama essentially lost uh, Congress and um, the Republican Party proceeded to obstruct uh, essentially all of Obama's uh, agenda. And ultimately this led to the election of Donald Trump with America even more uh, divided. And the divide is basically about four major areas. First, there's a huge factual divide about uh, what uh, information is reliable, who's telling the truth, uh, which is quite uh, remarkable. We often talk about how this is um, a common issue in uh, modern societies with the spread of social media and the internet, but it's on a much higher level in the United States, partly due to the history of anti-intellectualism as a subculture uh, which has fostered peculiar mindsets and skepticism uh, of education. The second uh, major area of divide is about uh, questions regarding the economy and wealth inequality. America is much more uh, unequal than other Western democracies in terms of wealth. It's also the only Western democracy without a universal healthcare system. There was a time when America had greater social mobility than many other Western democracies, but today uh, it's uh, certainly not the case. Uh, the third major area of divide is over religion and culture war issues like abortion, uh, which um, is an issue that keeps being relitigated re in America over the last uh, few decades, uh, which is quite atypical by uh, Western standards when other Western democracies legalized abortion, it was typically a battle and then people moved on. It was accepted as a fundamental right for women to control their body and their autonomy and decide whether to have an abortion. But uh, since uh, Roe versus Wade uh, in 1973, uh, the um, US uh, religious right movement has kept litigating the issue. And now we see that becoming even more important with the recent death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her replacement by Amy Coney Barrett, who may vote to reverse Roe versus Wade at the US Supreme Court. And last but not least, there's a huge racial divide in the United States. It's not a new issue. America has historically been the Western democracy was by far the highest proportion of racial and ethnic um, minorities. Therefore, race has historically colored many issues in American history. Think of the US Civil War as a clash over the status of African Americans. And nowadays we still see so many echoes of these questions. Uh, and of course that's uh, uh, compounded by the divide over immigration in a rapidly changing United States. Wow, and it's interesting because, you know, we've, many of us have grown up sort of thinking of the United States as this beacon of democracy, the society we all aspire to want to be, immigrants constantly wanting to move to the United States uh, and chase the American dream. So it, it's really interesting that there are so many issues. And I, I really think we're going to have a chance to sort of unpack again a few of these issues over the, next, over the time we have together. But thank you for setting up that great context for us. Um, Professor Opal, let me turn it back to you. Uh, we've had a chance to connect on webcasts like this similarly twice uh, so far in 2020. Um, back in February, you suggested that this election would boil down to basically one thing, and that is that it would serve as a referendum on President Trump and his leadership these past four years. And then when we had you back on in April in the context of the pandemic, uh, you made an even more pointed argument, suggesting that the vote would in fact come down even more specifically to a referendum on the president's handling of the coronavirus pandemic. So do you still feel this way? Is, it, is that still the case when voters go to the polls? Um, so I hate to say that I, I feel like I was right, but I think I was right on that one, uh, <laughs> uh, unusually correct, um, in the sense that, um, as Professor Jouet has pointed out, there, there's such a way where, where Mr. Trump um, embodies and sort of magnifies these profound visions in American life that are, I agree, qualitatively more intense than in other Western democracies. Um, so it was going to be a referendum about him. In addition, or, or more pointedly with the pandemic, I think it's just very clear that that is the, the most seminal issue. And uh, of all the polls and polling, um, which always have been taken with some criticism or skepticism, there are a few that I find particularly helpful and revealing. Uh, one, for example, which has been a good longitudinal study, uh, isolates 
those voters who approve of Mr. Trump's handling of the economy, but disapprove of his handling of the pandemic. It's about 12% of, of these likely voters. And that group of people who I suppose we might call swing voters in some way, overwhelmingly favor Biden, uh, which indicates to me that the pandemic um, is, I'm not going to, to pretend to be neutral here, is properly seen as having been objectively terribly handled by the, the administration. But that is the, is the most seminal uh, issue in this election. Um, I, I'll, I'll stop there, but I just wanted to, to follow up on one thing that, uh, that Mugami had pointed out, which is when I said at the opening that there are a couple of times in American history where before an election happens, the legitimacy of that election or the acceptability of that election is in doubt. The only other one that comes to mind, and I didn't want to go there, you know, kind of right away, but, but yes, the election of 1860, uh, which brought Abraham Lincoln um, and the Republican Party to power, then a, a party opposed to the expansion of slavery, that election, previous to that election, most Southern states made clear they would not accept that outcome. Uh, Mr. Lincoln's name was not on the ballot in several su Southern states. Um, I, I'm not saying there's a, a parallel in another sense, but that is a, I'll say, a, a disturbing parallel um, with 2020. Wow. Interesting. And again, we'll have a chance to, I think, delve into some of the history uh, as we try, again try to contextualize what this election means for for America and for its voters. Um, let me go back to you, Professor Jouet. I mean, you you sort of mentioned a lot of the other issues um, that have come to the fore, and it's interesting because when we think back to you know March and April, you know, at the beginning of this pandemic arriving in North America, it felt like that would be the single only. You know, overriding issue of 2020 and of this electoral campaign. And yet, you know, we've seen so many other issues come to the fore, whether it's social justice, the role of policing. Uh, you made a reference to the recent passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and now a, a very pivotal vacancy on the U.S. Supreme Court. So where do you expect all of these other issues to factor into the minds of voters? Or in your opinion, is it really going to come down to health and the pandemic and getting uh, coronavirus under control? I agree with many of uh, Professor uh, Opal's uh, observations. Uh, in uh, democratic societies, uh, the public uh, often votes uh, based on uh, the state of the current government and whether it generally approves of, uh, of its uh, policies and often um, without actually being aware of um, the fundamental issues because a huge number of uh, people in democratic societies don't follow politics uh, closely. And that's certainly an issue in the US uh, as well. By international standards, uh, voter turnouts in America tends to be quite low. On top of that, there are efforts made to make it harder for people to vote, which we can talk about later. But uh, leaving that aside, uh, many people don't follow politics closely and don't um, uh, vote. And here you have a, an election where in a way it could be interpreted as a referendum on Donald Trump's uh, presidency and handling of the economy and the coronavirus. And that's where the question of different factual universes comes into play. Many people um, believe that um, the administration has handled the pandemic extremely well and the economy extremely well. And it's true that uh, the economy has performed uh, quite well uh, during uh, the Trump presidency, especially uh, for uh, people who are privileged, uh, but that's uh, a longstanding uh, trend in American society uh, that there's a growing wealth inequality, uh, but also people tend to think of the president as the CEO of uh, the economy, uh, which leads uh, presidents to either take a lot of credit or a lot of blame for uh, big picture economic issues that they uh, do not necessarily control. And I would add that the election can also be seen as an assessment of the state of American society and of the ways in which Donald Trump has changed fundamental norms key to liberal democracy. When Trump was considering running for president in the 2000, 12 presidential uh, election or 2016, uh, he was um, widely seen as a joker. Uh, many people, even uh, on the conservative side, felt that he stood no, no chance and that he would just be uh, the laughingstock uh, of, uh, of the public. Uh, but behold, he 
won the nomination of the Republican Party. People believed that he would be handily defeated by Hillary Clinton. And yes, she won 3 million, vote, uh, 3 million more votes than Trump uh, in terms of the popular vote, but he won the Electoral College. And a, a huge share of the American public has actually embraced uh, President Trump. We see that his approval ratings have stayed around uh, 40%. Uh, uh, recently, the latest Gallup approval rating is 43%. So that suggests that um, no matter what Donald Trump says or does, he's very popular with a huge share of the American people. And uh, the election, of course, is a way to assess uh, to what extent these polls are accurate and where America is evolving. Right. But you mentioned the fact that he sort of ran in 2016 as a bit of a kind of outsider, at least, you know, I won't say joker, but at least as an outsider. And I think a lot of his campaign was basically shaking up the establishment, you know, and having Hillary Clinton as his opponent was probably a, a good setup for him to juxtapose himself against the establishment, the Clinton name. I mean, now it seems like four years later, he still seems to be running as the anti-establishment, even though he's been running the establishment for four years. So, Professor Jouet, I mean, do you how do you how do you sort of reconcile, or how does he reconcile those? How do you continue to be the outside the outsider when you've been in Washington running things for four years? What matters is perception. When Trump ran for president, uh, he was. Um, a billionaire or a multimillionaire, depending on how you assess uh, his, his wealth, uh, who had grown up uh, in extreme uh, privilege, very close to circles of power, but he was seen as a champion of uh, the underdog. And there are a lot of actually misconceptions here that uh, are worth noting. People think that the average Trump voter is a uh, white uh, working class, low-income person, but actually Trump tends to be uh, more popular among uh, the wealthy, and it's inaccurate to simply equate uh, Trump's uh, support uh, with uh, underprivileged uh, white people, many of whom actually support uh, the Democratic Party and probably will continue to do so in this election. Mm -hmm. Professor Opal, I'm not sure if you want to jump in on that, or um, I didn't, but go ahead, because I had one other point I wanted to touch well, on. Well, I think it's ahead. It's absolutely essential to get as accurate as possible, you know, sort of uh, who are the, you know, the 40 percent or so of Americans who, who really support Mr. Trump. And, you know, the to me, the accurate way to put it would be um, the, you know, sort of if, if by working class, you mean sort of union households, which are a very small, diminished uh, number of people in the United States, again, exceptionally small by Western standards. Uh, those households are deeply divided, often within the household itself. Um, some interesting numbers I looked at in Pennsylvania, union households there still support Democratic candidates more than Republicans. Um, the, the change that happened between 2012 and 16 was that white men within those households uh, shifted to considerably, about 10% more to, to Trump. Uh, but white women, um, people of color in uh, union households strongly support the Democrats. Um, so Professor Jue is, is absolutely right. So the, even if you look at the Republican candidates during the 2016 primary, the ones who voted for Trump tended to had, not tended to have, had a higher uh, income level and overall wealth than those who voted for other Republican candidates. Um, mm -hmm. To me, the most accurate way to put it is that he makes up a largely or has largely a overwhelmingly white uh, coalition that is of, of, different, uh, of different ethnic uh, income groups. If there's a single base to the to Mr. Trump's uh, uh, movement, it, it would be white evangelical Protestants who support him uh, massively, and whose support has been relatively stable. There's been a little bit of decline, but not much. So it's crucial to take this uh, seriously and to avoid the very easy media stereotypes, which, by the way, very much help Mr. Trump when it's said that his base are are working class people. Um, uh, uh, for whom or, or, or uh, for whom Mr. Trump is a, is a champion. Mm -hmm. So uh, thanks for, for uh, jumping in on that piece. I did want to ask you about one more piece that uh, Professor Jouet referenced in his initial remarks, which was this notion of voter, ap well, voter apathy or the fact that a lot of voters just don't pay attention and ultimately don't even show up to vote. Uh, I, mean, I mean, just to try to get my head around that, because it feels like this year in particular, it's really hard 
to avoid politics and be apathetic uh, with, you know, a president who takes up so much space and is in the headlines all the time. So do you see us that we're still going to be dealing with this sort of voter apathy um, or are things going to be different this time around, Professor Opal? I do think the voter turnout will be higher. It already is indicating. I mean, it's hard to measure because of the pandemic. So much more of the voting is, is um, uh, by mail. Um, but I do think it's going to be a much higher turnout or a higher than average turnout. Um, but it is true that since the early 20th century, previously the U.S. had very high uh, voter turnout rates. But since the early 20th century, the U.S. has been uh, declining in, in its overall participation rates. Um, and I think, I guess, two points I would make. Number one, one of that has to do with how hard it is to vote. And this is really not to be taken for granted in a place like Canada where Elections Canada and federal law uh, allows for or makes, makes uh, uh, um, provision for a couple hours for people to go to vote. That's really an important law or uh, norm. In the US, um, just as an example, last year alone, 1,200, 1,200 polling places in Southern states were closed. And so for an American who's almost certainly not going to be in a union, who has to work one or two jobs, it is not a small thing to take off work and go vote in a faraway place without public transportation. Those things really, really matter. Um, and as a final point, I'll say that there is a association in American history, very long standing, in which virtuous people or virtue itself is the opposite of politics. And that's unfortunate from a civic uh, standpoint, but undeniable from an historical one. And Mr. Trump really appeals to them, to that, to that, taps into that, that I am not so much far right as I am the anti-politics. It's a, a politics of being anti-politics. Uh, <laughs> appeals to uh, a considerable number of people. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So I think the some of them. One thing I think we can all agree on is how polarized the U.S. electorate is right now, uh, seemingly more so than in previous elections, and certainly much more polarized, as, as you've both referenced, uh, than what we see in other Western democracies like here in Canada and, and in Europe, for instance. Professor Jouet, maybe I'll, I'll turn the next question to you. I know your book and much of your writing explores this dynamic, uh, making the case that these societal divisions are not, in fact, new, but rather part of a phenomenon that dates back to to, it dates back to the founding of America in the 18th century. Can you explain your thinking behind this? And would you concede that U.S. society is in fact becoming even more polarized now in the 21st century? All this relates to American exceptionalism, which people often misunderstood, uh, misunderstand as a faith in American superiority, the notion that America is an exception in a sense of phenomenal or superior, but historically, American exceptionalism has primarily meant that America is an exception uh, objectively uh, compared to other Western democracies. And many questions that America is dealing with today uh, relate to American exceptionalism because Americans are far more divided over a host of issues that are either not controversial or much less controversial in other Western democracies, that would be Canada, European nations, Australia, and New Zealand. So for example, universal healthcare tends to be supported by both liberals and conservatives in other Western democracies. In America, we have the only Western democracy without a universal healthcare system and tremendous partisan divides over that very issue. And you could add a whole uh, list of questions to that, uh, um, to that picture, such as divides over uh, abortion, which are, are intense, divides over the right to bear arms, with America actually being the country in the world with the highest number of guns per capita, per person. Uh, you have uh, the United States um, being uh, the Western democracy with the sharpest wealth inequality nowadays. Uh, the one where lobbying uh, by uh, moneyed interests uh, has uh, the most uh, clout. You have other features that are tied to, to race and class, such as the fact that America has the highest incarceration rate of any country on the planet. Uh, Albert Camus, uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky, Brian Stevenson, many other thinkers have pointed that you can judge a society 
by its prisons. And the extraordinary harshness of American criminal justice offers a window into the state of American society, which is why the stakes in the US election are much more fundamental than the stakes in uh, elections in Canada, Europe, and many other democratic societies nowadays. Mm -hmm. So let me have, I have one follow-up question for you on this point, because you mentioned in your earlier remarks, something that really st stood up for me, which was this notion of anti-intellectualism. Uh, and that being sort of a bit of an undercurrent in the US right now, and maybe historically. And again, I'm having a hard time understanding that because if I think of the United States, I think of institutions like Harvard and MIT and Stanford and Silicon Valley and you know pioneers in space exploration and medical breakthroughs. I mean, I think most of the world looks at the US as being the center of science, technology and intellectualism. And yet you're arguing that there really is like another current of anti-intellectualism that I think President Trump is, is playing off of right now. Is that correct? Yes. As I explained in my book, Exceptional America, the United States is a nation of contradictions. Uh, historically, it has made huge contributions to intellectual life. As you mentioned, uh, it has some of the best universities in the world, American scientists, writers, artists, and beyond have made huge contributions to human knowledge. Americans were the first people to set foot uh, on uh, the moon, but all of this coexists with also an anti-intellectual subculture that is actually tied to the evolution of the United States. Uh, when America was founded, it was the first modern Western democracy to emerge from the Enlightenment. And there were a lot of contradictions in that epic over the nature of, of uh, equality and liberty with slavery and the uh, disenfranchisement of women and indigenous people. But there was an egalitarian spirit with the founding of America. And uh, this ultimately fostered uh, a conception of uh, equality that began to associate education with a badge of uh, superiority, the notion that uh, in America, you don't need to have too much knowledge because it's a land uh, of opportunities, a land where everybody is equal, everybody can just succeed using their common sense, using uh, hard work, and you don't need to be too educated. And that fostered uh, this uh, current uh, where many politicians uh, historically have uh, touted their ignorance or lack of knowledge about very fundamental issues. That certainly did not begin with Donald Trump. It's just the intensification of this longstanding pattern. If you look at uh, a figure like George W. Bush, uh, there are many uh, declarations of his that I give in my book, such as uh, him calling uh, Africa a country or uh, him not knowing about the uh, sectarian divides between uh, Shiites and Sunnis in Iraq uh, before invading that country. And uh, after uh, the Bush years, we saw the rise of figures that were even more anti-intellectual, such as Sarah Palin, who went for the vice presidency after being catapulted onto the national stage uh, by John McCain, and ultimately uh, Donald Trump, and this is part of a much wider phenomenon. And that intersects with other questions like uh, social media, uh, disinformation, because uh, even though these issues can arise in every uh, modern society, uh, the anti-intellectual mindset makes people more receptive to disinformation. Great. Well, thank you for that for that uh, history lesson. I think it's, it's, it's framed things really, really well. And again, given us a little bit of pause to think about uh, how we think about this election and some of the debates uh, playing out in the United States right now. So I, I do want to turn a little more directly to the election itself. And maybe I'll, I'll turn to you, Professor Opal, for this. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot for an election night prediction. And if you would like to offer one later before we close, I would invite you to do that. Um, but we have to acknowledge that the polls have shown uh, consistently that, that Joe Biden has been in the lead since he clinched the Democratic nomination this summer. And it seems like that lead is increasing or, or at least holding steady. Uh, on the other hand, four years ago, uh, most polls had Hillary Clinton in the lead heading right into election day. And we know how that turned out. So I guess my first question to you, Professor Opal, is can we trust the polls this time around? Is there anything 
different that is perhaps giving more confidence to the Democratic Party right now? I think there are some factors that make uh, Biden's lead somewhat more, considerably more um, comfortable than that for uh, Mrs. Clinton, for, for um, Senator Clinton. The first is that the lead of Biden has been slightly more substantial from the beginning, actually, of the election process. It's also been more stable. Mr. Biden also has higher favorability ratings than, than uh, Senator Clinton uh, did or, or does. Those things matter uh, uh, over the long term. In addition, the uh, polling has become slightly more, importantly, more sophisticated, most notably, and intersecting with what um, Professor Joey was just mentioning, with the phenomenon of voters who tend to, uh, voters who tend to be to not have a college degree tend to be less receptive to questions about their political preferences, and that probably uh, slightly tilted things in terms of earlier uh, non-weighted polling in 2016. This all being said, I think it's important to note that the polling in 2016, in terms of the national averages, was not really off, was only off by about one point. It captured a very late surge by Mr. Trump in the last two weeks of the campaign, which closed the gap to about three points. And in fact, he only lost by two points. No one would ever remember that there was a, only a one point error in the polls if Mrs. Clinton had won. Um, but that points out the importance of the Electoral College. So my mm -hmm. prediction is that the, uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll hazard mm -hmm. is that I do think that the most likely scenario is a electoral victory for Mr. Biden, something on the, on the, on the measure of a 2012 victory by Mr. Obama. So uh, relatively familiar electoral map, but there is a considerable possibility as well. I'll, I'll say a third or one in three or one in four in which there's again, a late surge by Mr. Trump um, to close the gap in the, the most important state to my mind, which is, is Pennsylvania. He has to win Pennsylvania. There's no way Trump wins the electoral count unless he gets Pennsylvania um, and probably Arizona as well. But he could make a late run there and close the gap such that the, 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 uh, the result is in doubt. And th that is a real possibility. I can't imagine that Mr. Trump will win the popular vote. I, that's, I think it's, it's almost impossible to imagine, but he could still win or come very close to uh, an electoral victory. Okay, great. Now, we most of the questions that have come in ahead of time, and even we just received one now, are around the Electoral College. So maybe we'll put that aside for a minute. I, I, we, I do want to come back and have you both maybe speak to what is the Electoral College and why is it so important. Um, but let me just stick with you, Professor Opal, because you, you talked about Professor Trump trying to close this gap. So, I mean, I guess if you were on the, his campaign or, or, or sort of assisting him, what, what would this, the president have to do right now? I mean, we know that, you know, he's continuing to court his base, which seems to be rock solid. And that's probably that 40 percent, you know, uh, that is not going anywhere. But I mean, what kinds of voters does he need to get to get over the hump, at least in the Electoral College, if not in the popular vote? And I'll throw this in as a, a second question. Why the fascination with white suburban women that they keep hearing about over and over again? Yes, uh, just on, on October 13th, he actually said, suburban, William, suburban women, will you please like me? I saved your <laughs> damn neighborhood, okay? Um, that was in Pennsylvania. So here's my take on that. What is happening there is that, again, thinking of the state of Pennsylvania, which for the last 200 years has been known as the Keystone State for a reason. In the east of, of Pennsylvania, you have an area that's similar to the East Coast. In the west of Pennsylvania, you have um, you know, kind of industrial area that's, that's, that's sort of transitioned towards a new kind of economy. And in the middle, it is often referred to as Pennsylvania, a much more conservative, uh, almost sort of southern leaning area. So why the suburban women? What he needs is to basically keep the suburban vote in the vast sub suburbs of Pennsylvania and uh, uh, Philadelphia, excuse me, and Pittsburgh relatively even so that he can uh, run up the, his uh, favorability or, or his majorities in the middle of that state. I really think that's what this is about. It's he needs to get suburban women in two major metro areas on either side of, of Pennsylvania, um, as well as those in the major metro areas of Arizona uh, to at least, if not vote for him, then to not vote completely against him. Because uh, forgive me for one more, one more poll, but there was an interesting poll done just on gender, uh, forget race, class, men are pretty much evenly split. Women, according to this poll, favor Biden by 23%. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Trump has to narrow that. So if I were his campaign manager, and I don't want to be his campaign manager, just to say, I would tell him, talk about fracking, because there are jobs in Pennsylvania that are tied to that industry. If you wanted to make the case that Biden would cost some jobs, you would go there. And um, in terms of his courting suburban women, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to talk about that. I just can't make an argument on behalf of Mr. Trump when he's saying things like this um, to women. Uh, I, I read a Washington Post op-ed the other day, which described his approach to women as um, creepily transactional. And uh, I just don't know what I would say to him about, about the suburban women problem, uh, other than to say that he certainly has one. And it's not just suburban white women that he has in mind. Um, it's uh, pretty much all women. Mm -hmm. So, Professor Joy, let me ask you about one other uh, interesting constituent group I think that's really at play in this election, and that's older voters. So my understanding is that older voters tend to be more conservative, would tend to vote for the Republican Party, uh, probably helped win Florida, for instance, for the president, you know, four years ago. Um, but now we've got the pandemic at play. Um, which obviously is having a lot of, you know, bringing healthcare to the fore uh, and obviously is impacting and scaring, frightening uh, older w voters a lot more. So where do you think an older, the, the whole sort of the, the, the battle for older voters is playing in terms of the historical framework you've looked at and current events around the pandemic right now? My sense is that older voters, like the electorates in general, have different uh, characteristics, they have different things they care about. You may have a, an older person who um, has historically been uh, quite uh, conservative, or one who's quite liberal, one who may be very strongly uh, against abortion or very much in favor of the right to abortion. Um, so it's hard uh, to, um, for me to simply uh, speak about older voters in the abstract. I would say also with regard to the pandemic, this raises again the question of um, different uh, perceptions or factual universes. Um, if uh, you are uh, an older person who has been um, listening to a lot of uh, right-wing uh, uh, talk radio, um, who's been watching uh, Fox News, uh, a, a news station that has a strong nexus to the Trump administration and that functions a bit as an arm of the Trump uh, presidency, uh, your perception of how Donald Trump has handled the pandemic or the economy might be that he's doing a, a mighty fine job. And therefore, um, insofar as you may have uh, concerns, uh, you may think that in the end, he's going to be better uh, than uh, Biden. So uh, age would uh, relate to many of the other factors we've talked about. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that. So maybe I will turn to a couple of the questions we got from alumni now. Uh, like I said, a lot of them have come in around the Electoral College itself, which I guess for Canadians is a bit of a demystify or mystifying factor. I know we do have here a sort of a, a parliamentary system where people do vote in ridings and the ridings are add up. So you could win the popular vote and lose the election, uh, but probably not to the same degree as you have in, in, in the United States where you've got all this weighting of states. So let me just see. So we've got um, a couple of questions. So Lise Couturier had written in asking if someone could explain the popular vote versus the delegates. And why was it that in 2016, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, but not the election? Uh, Anna Campagna has asked simply, how does the Electoral College vote work? And how does it impact the results for the vote for the president? Uh, and a question that's just come in while we've been on the air from Mercedes, who wants your thoughts about abolishing the Electoral College. Um, Professor Opel, maybe I'll turn to you to start. Maybe you could explain to us what is the Electoral College? Why? Does it exist and how does it impact uh, the counting of votes? Sure. So the Electoral College is, is set forth in Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an odd thing because the framers themselves in 1787 weren't sure how this would go. They were up against an immediate, future, uh, immediate history in which the executive power, notably the royal governors, was what the revolution was largely against, as well as the British Empire itself. So they were wary about having too powerful a president, which is why it's Article 2, not Article 1. Congress is supposed to be really in charge. Um, but essentially, this is how it goes. Each state has, an elect, has electors. It is the same number of representatives they have in Congress, which is to say two senators, no matter the size of the state, and then the same number uh, or the um, a number of, of 
House of Representatives figure uh, uh, delegates relative population, right? So small states have four electors, uh, two senators and two, and two representatives, but they're not those people, they're separate electors. Uh, these electors then go to um, the Capitol and they're supposed to vote on December 14th. They cast their vote for the person who won the vote in their state, not the national vote. So uh, that's why it's possible to win the electoral college and, and uh, lose the popular vote, which has happened four times. And so essentially in 2015, uh, Clinton ran up massive majorities in states like New York and, and California, and those electors are all counted for her. But she uh, barely lost in the crucial Great Lakes states. Trump won all those states by less than 1%. Uh, so it's a small margin popular, but just past the post, you win all of Ohio's votes. You win all of Pennsylvania's electors, and they're the ones who select the president. So putting it another way, the president of the United States is not elected by directly the American people. The president of the United States is elected for now by the electoral college made up of 538 people uh, who would vote for or are supposed to vote for the person who won their state and not the national vote. I'll, I'll end there, but I'll just say there is an, a, a movement afoot to uh, essentially render the electoral college much less relevant without changing the constitution. Uh, and basically it would be to, to say, okay, the electors can still come and still vote for the, uh, select the president, but they're going to take a compact to say that we're going to give, give all of our state's votes, uh, all of our electors for the national uh, popular vote winner. Uh, it's, a, it's a quite serious movement that is, might become very relevant very soon. Oh. If, I, if I can jump in with um, mm -hmm. a few um, other elements, the electoral college uh, has many, uh, perverse uh, dimensions. Uh, first of all, it makes uh, the electorate's votes uh, in uh, many states essentially irrelevant. For example, California nowadays is uh, overwhelmingly democratic. So a uh, Republican running for the presidency is not going to waste time campaigning in California because he knows he's not gonna get the vote in California. By the same token, Alabama or many other Southern states are extremely likely to vote Republican in the presidential election. Therefore, people, uh, the president, uh, the Democratic candidate for the presidency is not going to go campaigning in uh, these parts of the country because um, there are no votes to gain because it's a winner take all system uh, in uh, the number of uh, delegates as um, Professor Opal mentioned. And that turns the focus into a number of swing states on which the US uh, election uh, centers. We talk a lot about uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, Florida, which have a huge impact in setting the fate of the United States. Why is America essentially the only country with this system? How is it possible to have a system where the candidate who wins the overwhelming majority of the votes, uh, Hillary Clinton, for example, three million plus uh, votes over Trump in the last uh, presidential race. How is it possible that that person not win that you have that electoral college? A factor here is that the electoral college is the legacy of another dimension of American exceptionalism, which is the weight of uh, race and slavery in American history. In the founding era, there was a debate among the framers of the U.S. Constitution about having a direct presidential election. Southern states were vehemently against it because they had fewer eligible voters. Um, they had a sizable slave population that uh, would not be allowed to vote in the election among uh, white men who could vote. There were many more in Northern states. So Southern states felt we are always going to be dominated by the North if we have a direct presidential election. So we're not going to stand for that. And that led to a compromise in the form of an electoral college that attributes votes on the basis of the uh, population in a particular state. And there was a compromise where in that epic, slaves were counted as three fifths of a voter 
for the purpose of counting the population for the electoral college. Uh, and therefore, that was, in a way, an incentive to keep having slaves, because the more slaves you had, the more electoral votes you would have in the electoral college. Uh, but of course, you would not do anything uh, to abolish slavery or to improve the condition of African Americans. And even uh, once slavery was abolished, this system has stayed. And with regard to the question of abolishing the electoral college, there are two reasons why this is a non-starter. First, the Republican Party would vehemently oppose it nowadays because it has nothing to gain from that reform because today it tends to heavily favor Democrats. Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, yet lost the Electoral College. So did Al Gore against George W. Bush. If you had a more even, evenly distributed outcome where a Republican might lose the electoral, uh, might lose the popular vote, might, sorry, might win the popular vote, yet lose the Electoral College, you might see more Republicans being sympathetic to this idea. But nowadays, to them, this proposal is dead on arrival. And there's another reason why it's extremely difficult to change the Electoral College tied to yet another dimension of American exceptionalism, which is that the US constitutional system, for all its benefits and uh, the ways in which it has um, uh, enabled the rule of law and um, civil liberties and other dimensions, in some ways, it's extremely rigid. It's extremely difficult to amend the US Constitution. You need a supermajority of Congress plus a supermajority of state legislatures, or you need to have a constitutional convention. That's certainly not going to happen. It's happened a few times in American history and uh, virtually never with regard to questions over which um, the uh, two parties or other actors were evenly polarized. Great. Well, there you have it. Any, everything you ever wanted to know about the Electoral College. So thank you both. Uh, let me turn to the next question that came in from uh, Anna Campagna. Um, and this is something you referenced earlier, I think, uh, I think both of you actually referenced sort of this notion of the president, perhaps not accepting the results of the election. Um, and voter suppression. So actually she sent in two questions. I'm gonna sort of, I guess, couple together as one. Uh, so her questions are, is there a voter suppression problem in this election? Will all votes be counted, including mail-in ballots? And if the results of the election are challenged, what happens? What roles do the Supreme Court and Congress play in this situation? And there's a lot in there, but maybe Professor Opal, I'll turn to you to maybe unpack a little bit of that for us. Sure, so I think the best way to put it is um, the most likely scenario of a disputed election would be again, involving the Electoral College. Um, I'll keep going back to Pennsylvania because I think it's really a good model. There's 20 electoral votes, elect, uh, electors in stake there. What if the popular vote, which will be confusing this time because of the number of mail-in ballots counted for the next three days after the election is over, according to a recent Supreme Court decision, what if it's less than 1% or less than 2%? And Mr. Trump immediately says, no, it was fraudulent. There are several hundred thousand votes, uh, ballots that are so-called naked ballots that didn't have the proper address on it or whatever else. What happens? Probably what would happen is that the, the state government in Pennsylvania or the Republican Party in Pennsylvania could send separate electors to the United States Capitol for the meeting of the Electoral College on December 14th, which means you would have you know, okay, delegates from electors in Pennsylvania, please rise, and two groups would rise, one for Biden, one for Trump. What happens then? This has happened once, it happened in 1877, when they were dueling electoral groups. Um, supposedly what happens is, it would, is that Congress is supposed to decide the issue, which is to say, if there's a dispute, it goes to the Congress in which each state has one vote. So instead of California having, uh, which has 55 members of, of Congress having 55 votes and Idaho having four, because it only has four, they each should be one and one. And then it's really, uh, you know, all bets are off because, well, which, which congressmen, the ones who are leaving office or the ones who are coming into office? Probably those coming into office because they take their seats on January 3rd. But there's nothing clear about this in the Constitution, and there's, there's not a good precedent for it. And I'll just you know, say that to add to Professor Jouet's comment that not only is the Constitution, for lack of a better term, old, 
it's also and rigid in some ways, it's also not clear in other ways. That's why it's so durable, but it's causing so many problems now for my home country. And I think one thing that, you know, perhaps Canadians take away from this is keep your democratic protocols and democratic institutions somewhat up to date. Um, the, the democracies around the world that are showing themselves to be more agile, to be able to confront their problems, not necessarily to solve them, but to confront them, are ones that have far more recent constitutions or constitutional reviews or updates to their best practices of, of democracies. That's, a, a, I think, a really important point. Um, so it's a long answer, but I'll just say it would most likely be confusion in certain of the key states as to who the electors from those states are supposed to vote for on the real election, which is December 14th, when the Electoral College meets, that's the election that decides who's president. Wow, all right. Well, and one, one thing I could add um, with regard to um, voter suppression is that in the United States, there is a um, peculiar political culture where there's a notion that it's not really the electorate that chooses the um, public officials, but rather it's the public officials who choose the electorate that they want in order to get uh, elected. Mm -hmm. um, that's um, a dynamic with regard to gerrymandering. It's also dynamic with regard to voter suppression. Um, voter suppression has a long history. It basically means that you make it harder for some people to vote because you expect that they won't vote for you. And historically, that has been intertwined with the question of racism in the United States. There were a lot of mechanisms that were used, say, under segregation to make it harder or impossible for Black people to vote. And we see that there are many more uh, insidious methods nowadays that disproportionately affect uh, racial minorities and make it harder for them to vote. And that's tied to the fact that in America, minorities tend to overwhelmingly vote for the Democratic Party. As a result, uh, Republicans are keener on suppressing um, their vote uh, for these reasons. And this is also intertwined with other dimensions of American exceptionalism such as the weight of anti-intellectualism and conspiracy mongering. The ways that are used to make it harder for people to vote, to suppress their vote, um, are not only animated by uh, racial prejudice but, or political interests, but also by conspiracy theories, such as the notion that it's extremely common for people to um, engage in fraud during US elections, even though that's totally false. Fraud in US elections is uh, very rare. And uh, you have a, a situation where that's used to rationalize uh, these policies. And that's also intertwined with the evolution of the US Supreme Court, uh, which has limited uh, or um, restricted some of these legislative measures under the Voting Rights Act, which were meant to preclude these forms of uh, voter suppression. And of course, here we see that reach another level with Donald Trump's um, rhetoric, because not only has he embraced the Republican Party's um, efforts toward voter suppression, he's also insisted that either he wins the election or it's fraudulent. And he's also insisted that Hillary Clinton had been backed by millions of undocumented voters, uh, predominantly Latino and others, uh, and that's why she got more um, popular votes than him, which is totally false. And of course, we have to add that to other aspects of Trump's rhetoric that are quite peculiar by the standards of Western democracies, his praise for many dictators uh, from Kim Jong-un in North Korea, to Vladimir Putin, to uh, Duterte, the uh, strongman in the Philippines. And you see that he has uh, affinities for authoritarianism and he's calling into question the norms of the US political mm -hmm. 
legal and social system. And in a way, this election is not about Donald Trump. It's never really been about Donald Trump. It's really about the American people. It says a lot more about the state of American society than it could ever say about Donald Trump because we see uh, how this type of uh, political rhetoric and conduct can be supported or rationalized or condoned by mm -hmm. certainly a far larger share of the electorate than many experts anticipated. Great, well, thank you both for, for those answers. We have time probably for one more question. So um, I, I am curious about this and I'll ask, I'll ask the question, I'll, I'll give you each a chance to respond. Maybe you could sort of respond um, briefly. Um, so I know we often look at the US as sort of a bit of a kind of, with all its faults, as sort of being a bit of a model, a beacon for democracy and sometimes a, a, a sort of a warning of what's to come. Given all that we've discussed in the last hour and, and some of the uh, issues around this election and the sanctity of the electoral process, should we in Canada and other Western democracies like in Europe and elsewhere be concerned that what we're seeing in the United States playing out right now might end up impacting what I would perhaps call the health of democracy in other countries? Um, Professor Opal, you wanna start with that one? Sure, um, it's a huge question. I'll just say two things. The, the first is that uh, regardless of your political leanings or your understanding of how society should be run, I think you should stand up for the idea of society, which is to say that that idea of people being relatively tied together and there being a thing of, called the general well-being or, or salus populi is absolutely essential. And the more unequal society becomes, the more it frays and snaps. Um, Voting for Donald Trump is in some ways a revenge on society. And you it's important to not have that uh, uh, motive. And then the second thing I, I mentioned is just that I, as much as I admire and study the founding documents and the political engineering and architecture uh, that the American framers were able to put together, which is quite remarkable, it is old. It is not designed for um, a society of, of nearly 350 million people. Um, it is straining and really showing its age. And so I think it's important for other countries, Canada included, to understand that, yes, you want institutions to last. That's why it's an institution and not, an, and not a, uh, just an event. But there ought to be some kind of updating and some kind of way that you keep yourself abreast of and define yourself not against your enemies. Um, don't do that. Define yourself in relation to other democracies and see how they're doing in terms of their of their best practices. Okay, great. And Professor Jouet, in 60 seconds, should we be worried here in Canada? Canada is not the United States. Canada is not remotely as polarized as America over a host of fundamental issues. Uh, it would be uh, incorrect to simply equate the evolution of the American Republican Party with the evolution of the Canadian Conservative Party uh, in Europe, we see more of a nexus with what's been happening in America with the rise of illiberal democracy in some places, such as Hungary and Poland. And we see also uh, the rise of the far right uh, in other parts, uh, Italy, France, um, the United Kingdom. But still, uh, Europeans are polarized over far fewer issues than uh, Americans. Uh, the nexus is often at the level of uh, immigration or resentment towards institutions like the European Union. If you look at the United States, there's a huge list of other issues that are, again, not controversial or much less controversial uh, than, uh, in, uh, than in Western Europe. And therefore, we have to be wary of uh, assuming that uh, the types of political divides that exist in America uh, are similar or identical to the problems of other societies. Great. Right. Well, thank you. So I was going to end by asking each of you for electoral predictions. Uh, I know, Professor Opal, you sort of made a reference that you think that uh, Joe Biden will carry the popular vote and the Electoral College will be closer. Um, we'll, maybe we'll leave, we'll leave it there. Professor Jouet, I think you said you were a bit more, a bit less comfortable uh, with, with an actual prediction. Um, and if it's anyone hard. wants to, <laughs> sorry. It's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, well why, why don't we leave it there then? Um, and that does just about wrap up the time we do have uh, for today. Anyway, I see we're at the top of the hour. Um, before we close, I'd like to remind uh, everyone that this video will be available at this very same link soon after our recording ends. So feel free to share it with others who may not have been able to tune in live. Um, I would, of course, like to extend my, my deepest gratitude to our two guests today, Professors Jason Opel and Mugambi Jouet, for joining me today and sharing with us their incredible insight on the upcoming election and some of the broader concerns they have around the health of our democracies. Uh, if I were a McGill student today, I think I would be first in line to sign up for both of your classes. Uh, you both sound like in incredibly intelligent and, and insightful speakers. So thank you for sharing that with, with our larger alumni and wider community networks today. Um, and as I mentioned at the, at the outset, uh, please uh, be sure to join us again in exactly two weeks on Thursday, November 5th, two days after the, uh, the election, uh, when both of our professors will be back uh, with us on our panel to review and analyze the election results. Uh, and discuss what they mean for America, her allies, and the global community. And I suspect we will have quite a lot to talk about uh, in two weeks' time. So until then, please stay safe and be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.